On this episode of the Hockey Nuts podcast, we'll have all the exciting details of the World Cup Finals. We'll also discuss the NHL headlines and preseason highlights from this past week. Then we'll give you our bold playoff predictions and who we think will win the individual awards. All this plus some college hockey talk, the KHL Minute, and our picks of the week coming up next. This is the Hockey Nuts Podcast, Season 1, Episode 9, recorded on Thursday, October 6th, 2016. Our bold predictions. Shut Shut up up and sit sit down. down. Check from Green. Ball from a decent from the score to Spooner. 34 seconds in. Boston wins it 2 to 1. Jensen to Perry. Gilmore to Perry. Stop it with his skate. Rangers also have Wojciech on. Perry with a shot saved. No goes in. Wedgwood thought he had it and trickled in. Brendan Perry. It's a power play goal, and the Rangers have a three to one lead. Hello, and welcome to yet another episode of the Hockey Nuts podcast. My name's Wayne Halley. I'm here with Steve Ball. How's it going today, Steve? I'm doing good. Good to be with you, Wayne. Great, great. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, we've got a lot going on coming up this week. Uh, this is the well, the preseason's been going on for about a week and a half now, and it's already starting to wind down. And the regular season starts uh, less than a week as we record this. Today's Thursday, October 6th, and I believe that the regular season starts next Wednesday, does it not? Yeah, Wednesday night, next week, the 12th, and I'm, like, counting down the seconds. Yeah, I believe the Bruins start... Uh, on Thursday of next week, even though the uh, regular season starts next Wednesday night, I, neither one of us, I don't believe, have any games that night. Uh, you, the Rangers? When do the Rangers start? We play Thursday night as well. Yeah, we open the season against the Islanders, uh, and I believe it's at home uh, at, at the Garden. Yeah. All right, cool. So we'll both be watching Thursday night. All right, well, let's move on to uh, talking a little bit about uh, a little non-hockey talk for a moment. Uh, as a lot of you listeners know, both Steve and I are located in North Carolina. And from what I hear, there's a little bit of, of a storm that's coming up the coast heading in our direction. Hurricane Matthew is, as we record this, is going through the Bahamas and is on his way up to the Florida coast. And it's expected to do uh, a ton of damage down there on its way up the coast. And it's eventually going to make its way up this way. But where Steve and I are located in North Carolina uh, should make it so that we're not too affected by it. Uh, Both of us live in the central part of the state. And at least the forecasts right now are forecasting that we'll get a lot of heavy rain from it. And a little bit of wind, but nothing that's going to cause any damage. So rest assured, Steve and I will be just fine. Uh, I know a couple of people that live down near the coast. They're making preparations to get through the storm. 
And Steve, do you have anybody who lives down that way that might be affected by this storm? I, uh, I, the only thing I can tell you is uh, a gentleman who works uh, with our company, but with a different uh, uh, branch of our company, so to speak. Uh, and he lives in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. He was evacuated today, so he was in our warehouse. And, uh, he's, uh, the governor, they've, they've evacuated a million people, if I heard it correctly. Uh, yeah, South Carolina is in full evacuation mode. Uh, um, the th- reports in the news, I saw uh, Charleston, South Carolina in particular. The uh, officials down there, they took uh, an interstate that's down that way, uh, Interstate 26, I believe, and uh, it's an east-west road, and they took both directions of that interstate. They turned one one of them, the eastbound direction, turned it around and make both sides of that highway westbound to help get as many people out of that area as possible because uh, Charleston, South Carolina, is expected to uh, really see a lot of uh, effect from this storm. So anyway... Um, so hopefully everybody who's down that way, who's going to be essentially more affected by the storm than we are, uh, is going to make it through okay. And we are uh, we are praying for everybody down that way. All right, let's move on to the podcast. Uh, before we get going, I want to put a big thank you out to everybody who's downloaded and listened to the show so far. We've had uh, we've been pleasantly surprised with the the rise in popularity of the show so far this. In just the first nine episodes, when Steve and I first started this thing, we we were we just decided to start a podcast mostly because a lot of the podcasts that are out there are from the point of view of members of the press who, granted, have uh, better access to uh, the teams and, and the players and such than we do. But uh, we wanted to put a podcast together that was of the fans perspective. And related to that, we'd like to get feedback from our listeners. And so far, the feedback has been pretty slow coming in. So um, if you'd like to give us feedback, there's many different ways that you can contact us. Uh, First and foremost, if you do enjoy the show and you are listening to it through iTunes, go ahead and give us an iTunes review. That would uh, greatly help. From what I understand, iTunes reviews do help podcasts go up the charts, so to speak, on the iTunes website. If you've got a minute and you enjoy the show, please certainly uh, give us a review on iTunes. Secondly, uh, if you want to email the show directly, we have an email address. The email address is feedback at thehockeynuts.com. And you can ask any question or give us any straight-up feedback. And if your email is relevant to the show, we'll certainly include it in future episodes of the show. If you don't want to go through all that typing, we have a voicemail box set up, a Google Voice box. And the number to that is 919-960-1718. Again, 919-960-1718. Now, that number doesn't ring either one of our phones, so you can call that number any day or, or any time, day or night, and we'll get the message when it's convenient for us. And just so you know, if you do leave a voicemail, we may use your audio as part of the episode, uh, particularly if you're asking a hockey-related question or giving us a hockey-related feedback to, you know, whatnot. We like to keep the show very interactive, so if you, if you do leave a voicemail and, and we find that the uh, voicemail is pertinent to the show and would add value to the show, uh, we'll use that audio as part of the show. We also have Twitter accounts. My Twitter handle is at WayneHalley9, and it's spelled W-A-Y-N-E-H-A-L-L-E-E-9, and it's the number nine. Steve is at Steve Ball, or I'm sorry, SBall504Man. We also have a Facebook page at Facebook.com slash TheHockeyNuts, and that's all one word. And on that page, I generally will put any hockey-related uh, things that I come across on Facebook that I find is interesting, I'll just uh, post them along on that web on that uh, Facebook page. And then lastly, we have a YouTube channel, and I'm not going to go ahead and put that out there because it's just a s- series of random characters. But if you'd like to see our YouTube channel, go to the show notes of this page, and there'll be a link included in the show notes. 
Now, with YouTube in mind, Steve and I are trying something out with this particular episode. We are live streaming it as we speak to YouTube. We decided to do that because similar shows that I have seen, with different topics, of course, there are a lot of people out there doing these live YouTube streams uh, that do d- just different talk shows, similar to what we're doing here. And they, the reason I wanted to do a YouTube live stream was I wanted to give our listeners the opportunity, number one, to see us, so you can watch us do the podcast, and we can, you'll get to see a little bit behind the scenes of essentially how we, how we make the sausage, I guess is the best way to describe it. So each week when we do record, and we generally record e- either on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday at around 6 p.m., we do our recording and then it takes a day or two for me to get the editing done because we both have full-time jobs and uh, those obviously are going to come first. But usually by Friday, Saturday at the very latest, I've got the audio podcast up and ready to go for everybody to listen to. But if you want to see us live and want to watch how this, you know, how we make the show, all the behind the scenes stuff, even a little bit of the discussion before and after the show, uh, you can go to the YouTube channel and you can watch the live stream. And we're also keeping the streams uh, after the fact. Once we're done recording, the show will be available as a live stream or as a as a regular YouTube video that you can watch after the fact. So uh, if you'd like to watch us in a video format rather than an audio format, uh, we're making that available th- via YouTube. Okay. So again, I want to again thank everybody. We greatly appreciate all the listens we've had so far. And we're very excited to have as many downloads and listens as we've had so far. And it definitely keeps us motivated to keep coming back each week. And Steve, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, but uh, uh, that's all I wanted to say for that. I just I just wanted to echo what you said, Wayne. Uh, you know, we're very grateful and thankful for, uh, for the folks that uh, are downloading our show uh, from all over, uh, not just the United States. And uh, it really is a humbling thing. Um, gosh, before you ha- we had set up uh, this podcast, I had no experience uh, doing this ty- type of thing. And here we are nine episodes later, and it's just an incredible uh, thing to, to, to see and behold people uh, downloading our show and, and listening to it. Um, all the work that, that we put in, and, and Wayne, I know you put in a tremendous amount of work on this sh- show. uh, I put in a lot of hours. We just scan everything, but it's fun for us to do, but it makes it worthwhile that it is is actually being more successful than I had ever thought. It's definitely been more popular than I've uh, thought that would be possible right off the start, especially given the fact that we started in the middle of the summer and nobody was even thinking about hockey back then. Um, But uh, uh, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, it's even more fun that we're actually getting a lot of listens, so uh, we appreciate it. Now, let's go ahead and move on to World Cup hockey. Let's go ahead and put that to bed. Um, Since we last recorded this show, we had one last game in the World Cup, and that was Game 2 of the final series. Uh, We 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 talked about Game 1 in the last episode where Canada won 3-1 in that game. Uh, But after we recorded last episode, they played game two a day or two later. And uh, I watched that game. I don't know if you did, Steve. I I watched part of it that night, but I did not see the whole game. Um, I can't remember the point at which I I cut it off. I think uh, I saw uh, Europe score the first goal, and I believe uh, that was it. I saw Europe was up one to nothing. I have to be up at the crack of dawn Friday morning, three o'clock in the morning. So I, <laughs> yeah, that is true. Your workday does start a lot earlier than mine, but I did watch the whole game, and it was a very exciting game. In fact, I thought at one point, late in the game, that Europe was going to uh, pull out the win. Um, with less than five minutes to go in the game, Europe was winning at one nothing. But at sixteen twenty-five of the third, Anzi Kopitar got a penalty for holding Corey Perry. And then at 17.07, Patrice Bergeron tipped in a Brent Burns shot from the point to tie the game at one. 
And then less than a minute later, Canada's Drew Doughty high-stick Europe's Tobias Ryder, giving Europe a power play opportunity to take the lead. But during the uh, penalty kill, Europe turned over the puck, and all of a sudden, Canada had a two-on-two with Jonathan Taves and Brad Marchand going up the ice with the puck against the two Europe defensemen. And essentially what happened was Taves went up the wing, the right boards, he's right along the boards in front of the benches with the puck, crossed over the blue line and just about the top of the circles, he crossed across the middle. And when he got over to the left circle, he dumped a sweep, uh, just dropped it back to Marshan, who was streaking through the slot. Marshan caught the puck and shot it all in one motion and beat Yaroslav Halak over the right shoulder and just put it right in the top of the net and at that point in the game there was only 44 seconds left in the game so Canada essentially stunned them with a late goal and then held on the last 45 seconds for the win so if you if you get a chance to see a replay of the game if you haven't seen it and want to see it you can pretty much fast forward to about the five minute or five minutes left in the third period and you can uh, see essentially all the exciting part of the game but it, it truly was an exciting game. It was a great series. Uh, Europe did much better than I thought they would. And there was one thing that kind of jumped out at me, though, with Canada. The players seemed to celebrate on the ice. You know, they definitely enjoyed the win. Don't get me wrong, but uh, it looked like the celebration wasn't, you know, it wasn't Stanley Cup celebrating. And, you know, rightly so. Stanley Cup is, you know, 125 years old, whereas this World Cup, this is only the third one. So... Um, but, uh, one thing that did jump out at me was when they glanced up at the press box, the folks in the press box, you know, the GM and, you know, all the, all the brass from team Canada, they were happy, but they looked, they weren't jumping around and celebrating like you would normally see in a press box. They were just sitting back with smiles on their faces and just sitting there talking almost like they expected it, which I get it. Canada expects to win these things, but they, they didn't seem to be enjoying it as much as I felt they should have. I mean, it's a great accomplishment to be crowned the biggest, uh, the best team in the world. So um, you, would th- you would have thought they would have, uh, en- you know, enjoyed it a little bit more than they did. They just seemed to be be happy yet relieved that they won the con or the won the tournament. I didn't see that. The last time I, I watched the World Juniors one time, Finland won. And uh, they sh- took a sh- glancing shot of the press box. And Tamu Solani was up there. And, man, he was going nuts with the whole Finland, all these Finland players. I think Yari Curry may have been up in there. And and they just, they, oh, I mean, the partying was ready to start, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I, I didn't see the, the end of the game there. So I, I, I take your word for it. I mean, it's a raucous environment if you win. Yeah, so. So yeah, that was pretty much it for the World Cup. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to it, but Canada takes it away and very quickly everybody got back to their NHL teams and and we moved on to the preseason. Yes. So what I'll go ahead and do is why don't we go ahead and take a minute and we'll go ahead and run down all the scores that have happened since the last recording of the last podcast, which would have been the 29th through today, which is the 6th of uh, October. So we'll go ahead and run down all those scores, and then we'll come back and talk about basically what happened over the past week. Okay, we'll start with Thursday, September 29th. There were six games that night, starting with Ottawa, who beat Montreal in Montreal 4-3 to in overtime. The New York Rangers were at home against the New Jersey Devils and beat them 3-1. to The Columbus Blue Jackets beat the Nashville Predators 3-2 to in overtime in Columbus. In a game taking place at the Meridian Center, St. Catharines, Ontario, the Buffalo Sabres beat the Toronto Maple Leafs 1-0 in a shootout. Minnesota traveled to Winnipeg and lost 4-1 to the Winnipeg Jets. And in the final game of the night, the Tampa Bay Lightning beat the Florida Panthers 2-0 in Tampa Bay. On Friday, September 30th, there were nine games. The Pittsburgh Penguins beat the Chicago Blackhawks one to nothing in Pittsburgh. The Toronto Maple Leafs traveled to Buffalo to play the Sabres and beat them eight to one. The Boston Bruins went to Detroit to play the Red Wings and beat them two to one in overtime. The Carolina Hurricanes had their first of just two home games and they lost to the Tampa Bay Lightning two to one in overtime. The St. Louis Blues were at home against the Dallas Stars and won four to one. The Winnipeg Jets 
hosted the Edmonton Oilers and beat them 5-1. to one. Colorado Avalanche hosted the LA Kings and beat them 3-1. to one. Vancouver traveled to Calgary where the Flames beat the Canucks 2-1. to one. And in the final game on Friday night, the San Jose Sharks hosted the Arizona Coyotes and beat them 3-2 to two in overtime. On Saturday, October 1st, there were seven games. The Montreal Canadiens traveled to Ottawa to play the Senators and beat them 3-2 to two in overtime. The Boston Bruins traveled to Philadelphia to play the Flyers and beat them 4-3 to three in a shootout. The New York Rangers made the long road trip over to New Jersey to play the Devils, where the Devils won the game 5-4. to four. The Washington Capitals and the New York Islanders traveled to the Webster Bank Arena in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and Washington won that game 2-1. The Nashville Predators hosted the Tampa Bay Lightning and beat them 4-3. The St. Louis Blues traveled to Chicago to play the Blackhawks, and the Blackhawks won that game 4-0. And in final game of the night, the Arizona Coyotes hosted the Anaheim Ducks and beat them 3-2 in overtime. On Sunday, October 2nd, there were nine games around the league. And in the first game, the Dallas Stars and the Florida Panthers traveled to Budweiser Gardens in London, Ontario to play a neutral site game, and Dallas won that game 2-1 to one in overtime. The Pittsburgh Penguins went to Columbus to play the Blue Jackets and beat them 2 to nothing. The Minnesota Wild hosted the Carolina Hurricanes and beat them 3 to 1. The Detroit Red Wings hosted the Chicago Blackhawks and beat them 6 to 3. Montreal Canadiens traveled to Toronto to play the Maple Leafs and lost 3 to 2 in overtime to Toronto. The LA Kings made the long road trip to Anaheim and beat them 1 to nothing. The Vancouver Canucks hosted the San Jose Sharks, and the Sharks came out on top 3-2 to two in overtime in that game. The LA Kings and the Edmonton Oilers played in Canada's version of the Kraft Hockeyville game at Cal Tire Place in Vernon, British Columbia, and the Edmonton Oilers came out on top in that game 3-2. to two. And in the final game of the night, the Calgary Flames hosted the Winnipeg Jets, and Winnipeg came out on top 4 to nothing. On Monday, October 3rd, there were five games around the league. The New York Islanders hosted the New Jersey Devils, and the Islanders came out on top 4-3. to three. The New York Rangers traveled down to Philadelphia to play the Flyers, and the Flyers came out on top 4-3 to three in overtime. The Washington Capitals hosted the St. Louis Blues, and the Capitals won that contest 2-1. to one in a shootout. The Ottawa Senators traveled to Winnipeg to play the Jets, and the Jets won that game 4-2. And in the final game of the night, the Arizona Coyotes traveled to Vancouver to play the Canucks, and the Coyotes came out on top 4-2. On Tuesday, October 4th, there were nine games around the league, and in the first game, the Boston Bruins traveled to Quebec City to play the Montreal Canadiens at the brand new Videotron Center, and Montreal won that game 4-3. In the USA's version of the Kraft Hockeyville game at Lakeview Arena in Marquette, Michigan, the Buffalo Sabres beat the Carolina Hurricanes 2 to nothing. The New York Rangers made the long road trip to Brooklyn to play against the New York Islanders, and the New York Islanders came out on top 3 to 2 in overtime. The Nashville Predators hosted the Columbus Blue Jackets, and the Blue Jackets came out on top 3 to 2 in overtime. The Detroit Red Wings traveled to Chicago to play the Blackhawks, and the Blackhawks won that game 6-1. The Dallas Stars hosted the Florida Panthers, and the Stars came out on top 2-1 in a shootout. Minnesota Wild traveled to Denver to play the Colorado Avalanche, and the Avs came out on top 2-0. To the Anaheim Ducks made the trip up to Canada to play the Edmonton Oilers, and the Oilers won that game 2-1. And in the final game of the night, the Ottawa Senators beat the Toronto Maple Leafs 3-2 in overtime at Saskatel Center in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. On Wednesday, October 5th, there were seven games around the league. In the first game, the Carolina Hurricanes and the Buffalo Sabres traveled to Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario to play a game at the SR Center. And the Hurricanes won the game 3-2 in a shootout. The Islanders made the long trip to New Jersey to play the Devils and beat them 3-2. The Pittsburgh Penguins hosted the Detroit Red Wings and beat them 5-2 in that game. The St. Louis Blues hosted the Washington Capitals and the Capitals came out on top 4-2. The Colorado Avalanche traveled to Dallas to play the Stars and beat them 1-0. The Calgary Flames hosted the Arizona Coyotes and beat them 2-1 in a shootout. And in the final game of the night, the San Jose Sharks hosted the Anaheim Ducks, and the Ducks came out on top in that game 2 to nothing. 
And in final night of action for this week, on Thursday, October 6th, there were six games scheduled around the league. And in the first game, the Boston Bruins traveled to Columbus to play the Blue Jackets and beat them 2-1. The Philadelphia Flyers made the trip up to New York to play the Rangers and beat them 4-2. The Montreal Canadiens hosted the Toronto Maple Leafs and beat them 6-1. The Edmonton Oilers hosted the Winnipeg Jets and beat them 5-2. And in the final game that was played on Thursday night, the Calgary Flames traveled to Vancouver to play the Canucks, and the Canucks came out on top 4 to nothing in that game. And there was one other game scheduled for Thursday night, featuring the Tampa Bay Lightning and the Florida Panthers that was supposed to be played in Florida, and that game was postponed due to the, the arrival of Hurricane Matthew. All right, so that was the scores for the past week. Now, why don't we go ahead and talk about some of the individual performances that have happened uh, over the past week. Uh, I'm actually looking at some of the stats that came out, and um, we'll go ahead and start with the Bruins. One thing that jumps out at me is Danton Heinen is having yeah. a huge preseason. Uh, he's played, at least the stats that I'm looking at, he's played three games so far, and he has three goals in three yeah, games. Yeah, he really is playing well. And he's a plus five. Yes, so not only is he doing well offensively, but but defensively, and the, you know the Bruins are you know they're only playing roughly 500 hockey in the preseason, so um, it's not like they're you know winning every game. But uh, David Pasternak has also got three points uh, in only one game. Uh, David Backus got three assists in his only game so far. Uh, Ryan Spooner has a couple of points. Austin Zarnick also has a couple of points. Yeah, so, Austin Zarnick's been playing very well, uh, Wayne. I've been impressed with his play. Yep. So my, my guess is if Heinen and Zarnik, two youngsters, um, if they're going to make the team, I mean, they're looking really good. And there's a couple of spots that are available for them. So I would not be surprised if both those guys end up making the team. They haven't been cut yet, at least not that we've seen. So, right. um, so let's go ahead and talk about some of the Rangers. Well, um, I, I uh, have been real, real impressed with, as I said, with uh, Mika Zabinijad. He, he hasn't played uh, every game. They've let him sit a couple games, but he he has definitely been uh, the uh, the straw that stirs the drink for the Rangers in the games that I watched. Uh, and Brandon Peary has really exerted himself as well. I've been impressed with both of those guys. Um, and Brandon Peary has, uh, has actually has six points. Is that right? Am I uh, four goals and two assists? That's right. Six points. Uh, as we speak, um, and I'm not sure if that includes the game uh, with the Islanders on Wednesday night that they lost. I'm not sure if he scored in that game or not, but um, he's playing very well. And uh, I, I I read on the website where it's a very good chance that uh, they're going to have several players make the team that are, you know, the youth uh, that uh, I, I heard that Brady Shea will probably make the team. Uh, Pavel Buchnevich is going to make the team. Uh, so that's really good. Their, uh, their young guys are going to get some, uh, some openings this year, which that doesn't happen very often with the Rangers, at least in the last, I'd say four or five years. Yep. They're becoming quite a young team now. Yep. Well, that's good. I, I think that's, that's the way it is in the, in the NHL these days. Um, right. teams, you got to have that good mix of veteran and, uh, youth. So you're right. That's exactly right, Wayne. So, yeah. um, what you know, one guy that's really jumped out at me, and I'm, I'm sure he's not going to end up on the top line, or at least I don't think he is, Brandon Peary. He's having a monster preseason. He really is. Uh, he, he is um, – he's excellent at distributing the puck. Uh, I've, I've also – you know, I've, I've seen his shot. He really has a very, very good shot. And uh, his, so I think his hands are very quick. And, um, I, I you know, I haven't studied him real, real close, but – I've been very impressed with uh, with that line. That line, though, that they have uh, Zabinijad, uh, Buchnevich, and uh, Chris Kreider is yep. really really uh, taken off. And I hope uh, Vino keeps keeps uh, keeps that going. Man, he's he's a master at picking lines. Um, he, he does a great job at it. Well, good. Well, good. Um, and, yeah. And, and what about uh, John Gilmore, defenseman? He's he, on the he's score that- sheet pretty high up. He's got two goals. In just yeah. two two games played. If I'm not mistaken, they sent him down to Hartford. Did they? Okay. Yesterday, the Rangers cut their roster to 29 players, and I don't believe John Gilmore made it. Okay. Well. Not sure why. Uh, I think he had a great one game. He had a very good one well, game. Yeah, that, and obviously you can't just, you know, 
if you judge a team simply by what you see on the score sheet, that would, you know, that's only a tiny part of their overall um, overall play. So right. if he's not doing well defensively, they're going to send him down and have him work on that. Yeah. So let's talk about our local Hurricanes. Um, one thing I've noticed with this team, although they are winning games, they're not, I think they're roughly 500, 2-2, two, two, something, somewhere in that neighborhood. 2-2-1, two, two and one, I think, was, was the last time I saw the standings. Uh, they're just not uh, scoring a lot, and that's concerning to me. Yeah, um, it, you know, it was one of their big questions coming into this season whether or not would they'll be able to score enough goals. Um, and you know, right now, um, their leading scorer at this point is Jeff Skinner with two points. You know, of course, he's only played two games. You know, Carolina right now, and I think every team does this: is they're spreading around all the games. No one player has played every preseason game. And I don't think you find that anywhere in the NHL. Right. Uh, a player that has played every preseason game. So Jeff Skinner's only played a couple of games, has a couple of points. Um, but that's it. I mean, two points is enough to lead the team with Carolina. Yeah. He's, he scored the game-winning goal last night in Sault Ste. Marie, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah, I didn't um, see I didn't see that game. So um, yeah, they, So that they, would be an addition to the two points that, that I have on my uh, stat sheet. Yeah, SR Center, SR Center in Sault Ste. Marie. Yep. Uh, which uh, my mother is from Sault Ste. Marie, so I've been to, to the Sioux uh, several, many times actually. Oh, okay. Over the years, so um, that that uh, that was I, I was really surprised the Hurricanes got a game up there uh, with well, the, uh, the Sabers. Yeah, well, they played the Sabers in the Hockeyville game in uh, um, in Marquette, Michigan. Right. So. Um, actually yeah, I, watched that game. Yeah, I did watch that game and it was, uh, uh it was, <laughs> I love the camera angle of that game. Yeah. The camera that was basically right over the, you know, 15 <laughs> feet above the ice, probably two rows back. If you, if you were, you know, in an NHL rink and I wish they could put a camera there for every NHL game. It actually reminded me a lot of, you know, just being in the local rinks that, that when you go watch high school games or college games in, in your local town rink. It's about the camera angle you have or the view you have if you go to one of those small rinks. Yeah, that is really something, Wayne. Yeah, I wish I wish they would uh, would be able. The problem is putting a camera in that spot in an NHL rink would would uh, knock out quite a few seats and and kill the view for quite a few uh, very high value seats. <laughs> yes, it in would those, in those NHL rinks. Yes, but. Um, so it was an interesting game to watch them playing in such a small arena. Mm. Uh, and I like watching those Hockeyville and I like that they, they're doing that, um, that Hockeyville stuff, um, because it gives these small towns a, a chance to see, uh, NHL players playing at their local rink. Yes. So, well, cool. So let's go ahead and move on now that we've discussed the actual games. Let's go ahead and move on to some of the headlines that have happened over the past week. And I know you have a, a bit of a list of stuff that has happened um, over the past 24 hours, uh, because we were originally going to be, uh, s- recording last night and I had my show notes prepared for that. But, um, but for whatever reason, we weren't able to record last night. We're recording tonight and anything that's happened over the past 24 hours. I was at work all day. I didn't get a chance to, uh, uh, get that stuff. So you have a list of that. I have a list of what's going on today, the major stories, and, uh, I hope I didn't miss anything, but, uh, the first one I had was Marty San Luis. Uh, his number 26 jersey will be retired by the Tampa Bay Lightning on uh, in a ceremony, special ceremony during a game on January the 13th. Uh, he will be the first player in Lightning history to have his jersey retired. And, of course, he is the team leader, the all-time leader in points, assists, uh, game-winning goals, power play goals, uh, and his 365 goals are second to Vinny LeCavalier's 383. So he owns a lot of the records uh, at this present time uh, for Tampa Bay, and I was really glad to, of course, I, I really love Marty San Luis. Uh, his time in, with New York was too short, and he yep. I, he really uh, was a great player, great player. Yep. Yeah, he was, he was. And of course, you know, with my roots in Vermont and he went to the University of Vermont and is actually a guy in my fantasy hockey league that knows Marty personally. They, oh, went, wow. they went to school together. They lived uh, in the same dorm when they were at UVM. So, yeah, yeah. He, he knows Marty personally. Uh, and I believe they there were they still communicate today. So because um, he drafts Marty every year. 
<laughs> in, <laughs> in the fantasy hockey draft. So oh, now, yeah. well, now that he's not playing anymore, he's he's not drafting him. But every year when he was playing, this this guy would draft. He'd draft him two or three rounds earlier than he would go just to make sure that he got him. So yeah, <laughs> those old those guys from the old guard of the Tampa Bay Lightning team that won in two thousand four. There's not too many of them left playing in the league. Nope. Uh, you know, you have uh, Le Cavalier retired, uh, now San Luis. Uh, Dan Boyle retired yesterday, and that yep. was another article. Yep. Uh, he did retire yesterday from the NHL. He played in 1,093 games and won the Stanley Cup in 2004 with Tampa Bay. But most of the guys from that team, uh, um, uh, Brad Richards, um, Dan Boyle, uh, of course, Marty San Luis, Yep. Uh, you can go right down the line. A lot of those guys uh, are, are are retiring or not playing. Vinny LeCavalier, those guys no longer play in the NHL. So. Well, that's 12 years ago. So. It's, yep. So, yeah, a lot of those guys are no longer in the league. That's right. Um, oh, cool. Let's see. This, the second news item, major item I had, uh, Wayne, was uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins were welcomed at the White House today by Barack Obama, and he used the occasion to give a special shout-out uh, to Phil Kessel. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes, Phil Kessel was uh, on the president's mind today. He said, we have a great announcement to make. And he said, Phil Kessel has ha has become a Stanley Cup champion. And apparently that was met with a wild round of applause and, uh, you know, cheers from all, uh, wherever they, whatever room of the White House they had that ceremony in. So uh, apparently uh, Phil Kessel was thought of pretty highly by the president. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder what, what, what brought that up. I'm not sure. I, I think maybe, uh, you know, he gets a, he gets a, uh, you know, he, I think he's. He's not uh, from Chicago, is he? N I, not to my knowledge. No. I thought he's from Minnesota originally. Yeah. Uh, I know he, he went. I know he went to the U, but um, he is an American. I know that. Yeah, he is American because there was uh, all that hubbub about him being snubbed for the uh, for the USA team. I know that, he's American. It, it may be a big part of it, right there, Wayne. That may be a big part of why you know President Barack Obama. He's he keeps up with hockey. Well, I know he's a huge sports guy. Yeah, and and especially basketball. Yeah. Um, but yep. I didn't. Um, he's born in Madison, Wisconsin, is what Madison, what Wisconsin. That's right. That's that's his birthplace. So, and I went. I know he went to the University of Minnesota uh, before yeah. he turned pro. Um, but he. Uh, I wonder he, what his connection he, with the president that he had to that he went out of his way to mention that. I I don't know other than maybe like like we said he 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 did not get picked to be on Team USA and that may have been a way that the president chose to uh, bring him into the. Uh, you know, bring him into the uh, the fold, I guess, uh, and 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 you know, give him a shout out for his, uh, yep. you know, his play in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Uh, he also he also commended uh, uh, Mike Sullivan, who I did not know uh, before his time with the Rangers. He actually worked in the Blackhawks organization. So uh, Barack oh, did he? Obama, okay. Yeah, Barack Obama knew that, and he brought that up during the discussion. Coach, too, Mike Sullivan. Yep, yeah, yep. And, and that may have been after the Bruins and before the Rangers. Uh, okay. But, uh, anyways, it, it was an interesting. Uh, it was an interesting article to read. It's in it's in today's NHL dot com. Hmm. I'll have to I'll have to look that up. Uh, I had uh, two others. Okay. Uh, from today, Connor McDavid was picked as the new captain of the Edmonton Oilers. I did see that. Yep. He's the youngest it, captain ever, right? Uh, the second youngest player in NHL history at 19. Okay. And I don't know who the first is. Um, might but have been, it might be Gretzky. It could be. It could be Wayne. Yeah. And uh, I could be wrong, I, but that would be I my best guess. Right, I think they did the right thing. I, I think Connor McDavid is so far ahead of his age in terms of his skill, his will, yep. you know, his, uh, his, he's just, uh, uh players like him are, are very, very rare indeed. And, and one of the reasons why you and I picked Edmonton to make the playoffs, uh, he's, he's doing that well. Yeah. So. And you know, he was, he was very impressive in the world cup in the, in the three games that we got to see him play. And I've, I've watched, uh, some bits and pieces of the Oilers highlights and games, and he's been impressive. I mean, for the Oilers, he's been dominant there in the preseason. So, and a lot of people that are, you know, all the uh, the upper um, reporters, the, the particularly the the more popular ones, are talking about him possibly winning the Art Ross this year. Although I don't see that happening. But yeah, um, 
but there's a lot of people projecting 80, 90 points for him if he stays healthy. Yep, wouldn't be surprised with that number of points. Uh, we'll talk more about the Art Ross later in the in the podcast tonight. Yep, yep. But uh, I I, uh, I did want to mention one other thing. Uh, apparently, and I don't know when this article came out, uh, but the Las Vegas uh, franchise, the uh, up-and-coming franchise that starts next year, broke ground on a new practice uh, facility that uh, the general manager, George McPhee, says is a state-of-the-art, best-in-the-business complex. Uh, it's going to run them $24 million. And somewhere in the city of Las Vegas, they broke ground on it. Wow. Uh, you, you you, and I are are in, in a, a rare, maybe, uh, situation in that both of our teams, the the Bruins, it's absolutely beautiful what you you uh, shared with us a couple weeks ago, and I've I've actually since went on Nesson and looked at everything. Uh, what a beautiful practice facility! But the Rangers have a beautiful one as well uh, in Terrytown, New York, and uh, that facility also houses uh, the Liberty basketball team, okay, and uh, some other some other uh, pro teams. I think the the Riveters, the women's team, may actually play there, but. Uh, yours is strictly uh, the Bruins, and it's devoted strictly to them. But but the yep. uh, Rangers facility is state of the art as well. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm still impressed with the one that Boston just built. Oh, it's uh, beautiful. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And beautiful. you know these 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 nicer rinks. Um, in a way, part of the NHL is is kind of like college hockey, where it's it's a recruiting game. Uh, if you want to convince uh, NHL free agents to come to your team. I mean, not only you got to have an opportunity for them, promise you know that they'll play first line minutes or second line minutes or whatever. Um, you know, you can't underestimate the the value of a really nice practice facility where they're they you know they can be comfortable. Um, they have all the amenities available to them to help them become a better player. Um, you can't underestimate that, and and to have a nice view out the windows. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. You're hundred percent right. Uh, it makes a big difference uh, versus uh, teams again that have the aging buildings where they, they uh, conduct their practices uh, and you go there mm -hmm. and then you go to a place like Boston. What yep. are you going to think? You know, it's, right. it's night and day. Well, I just saw another story that just came out. Uh, Mark Howe and Pat Kelly to receive the Lester Pastic Lester Patrick Trophy, uh, the Hall of Fame defenseman and the ECHL co-founder to be honored November 30th in Philadelphia. Mm. So uh, the Lester Patrick, I'm having trouble saying it, Lester <laughs> Patrick Trophy uh, is one of the most prestigious in hockey. Uh, it was presented by to the National Hockey League by the New York Rangers in 1966. It honors the memory of Lester Patrick, who spent 50 years in hockey as a player coach in GM and was a pioneer in the sports development. So yeah, great news there. Uh, so it's 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 an award that's giving recognition for their decades of devotion to hockey in the United States. Who was the co-founder of the ECHL? Is that Mark Howe? Uh, Pat Kelly. Oh, Pat Kelly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mark Howe is known more for his playing career. Okay. That's uh, Gordy's son, defenseman. Yes. Yep. So, and of course, the article goes on talking about you know what each of those guys did going forward, but. And I think the championship trophy might be named after him. I think it's known as the Kelly Cup, isn't it? Oh, you got me there. Um, I, I'll have to take your it word is. on it. Oh. It is. Yeah. Yeah, I see a picture of it right here. It's it's the Patrick Kelly Cup. So Very the championship good. trophy of the ECHL is named after this guy too. So, so yeah, he did quite a bit. Okay. All right. So let's move on to Tuesday the 4th. I've got a list of headlines in front of me. First of all, over the weekend... Lots and lots of transactions occurred throughout the league as teams are getting ready for the AHL training camps, which actually opened up this past Monday. Uh, so all 30 teams between essentially Saturday and Monday into Tuesday uh, released, most teams released 10 to 15 players, uh, dropping them down to AHL training camps. And of course, the Rangers and the Bruins were no different. Um, so you're starting to see the teams being pared down already. Uh, and then, of course, some of these players that got uh, released also went back to their uh, junior teams up in Canada. Because some of them can't play in the AHL until they are no longer eligible to play in the CHL. Right. <clears throat> so we're not going to go through a whole list of all those players that got down. We're talking hundreds of players at this point. So uh, if you want to see which, which players got dropped down for your team... Uh, go on to NHL.com. You'll find uh, plenty of information regarding to that. 
So And Wayne, you know, from experience, the Rangers are down to 29. I can speak directly about them. There'll be one more cut, <clears> and <throat> then they'll come up with the final. You know, there might be two or three guys battling for, you know, uh, a, a slot or two on the roster. Well, the uh, opening – yeah, the opening day roster, I believe, is 23 for every team. That's correct. Yep. So uh, the Rangers are down to – they got six cuts to make, and they will, I believe, make one cut and then make a second cut. At least that's how it's gone uh, in previous years. Yeah, I'm not sure where the Canes and Bruins are in that sense, uh, but I'm sure they're right around that number as well. Mm -hmm. They're getting down to it. So the last couple preseason games that occur this week, you're going to see NHL teams are going to be the, – the, the teams they put on the ice this week – will resemble very closely uh, what you'll probably see on uh, opening night. Right. All right. <clears throat> so as far as other uh, headlines, Barrett Jackman retired this past week as a member of the St. Louis Blues. He played 12 of his 13 seasons in St. Louis. Uh, he's 35 years old, uh, was accompanied by his six-year-old son, Caden, four-year-old daughter, when he made the announcement. Uh, his daughter's name is McKenna, uh, in, and he actually retired by signing a one-day contract uh, with the Blues, so it allows him to officially retire as a member of the Blues. Mm -hmm. He was a really good defenseman for a long, long time. I know that. <coughs> yes, he was. That was actually at the top of my list for the 24th, so, or, yep. or uh, the 4th. Yep. So, All uh, right. So Tob Tobias Ryder signed a two-year contract with the Coyotes. Uh, he was a restricted free agent forward and it was a two-year contract worth a reported 2.25 million uh per year for the two years he had 14 goals 37 points in 82 games last season uh and as far as him not being at training camp shouldn't be too much of an issue uh he played six games for team europe in the world cup so he should be almost ready to go yes and he you know if you follow the the coyotes at all, and I have for the last uh, few years. Uh, I, I'm one of those guys. If I can watch a late night game, I will. And usually, my wife and I would pick Arizona. He's a folk. He's a central part in that Coyote team. So um, it's no surprise that they're keeping him uh, on on uh, on the team. And you know, c congratulations to him. Yeah, and 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 I think Phoenix is going to be like Edmonton. Phoenix is going to be a fun team to watch this year. I'll probably. I'll probably start paying attention a little bit more to them now. I agree with you 100%. That's going to be the team in the West, uh, along with Edmonton, that's going to really make uh, a move, I believe. Yep. Okay, Central Scouting revealed uh, pre preliminary players to watch for next season's draft. Um, there was an article on the NHL.com. They mentioned Nolan Patrick as, as one of the leading candidates to be in the first overall pick for next year. Uh, there was 29 players on the list that were earned an A rating. All the players on the list earned either A, B, or C ratings. Uh, so a player that had A ratings is expected to be a first-round pick. Players with B ratings are considered to be second- or third-round picks. And then C ratings uh, were essentially players that are expected to be drafted but will end up being the fourth, fifth, or sixth round. Uh I included a link to the entire list of players if you're interested uh, in the show notes. Uh, you can go to the link to see all the players that are there in case you might know of any. Um, but these are the list of players that scouts will probably be watching, so we'll probably have to keep an eye on them as well. Yes. As we get to already talking about next year's draft. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And and the expansion draft, yeah, a lot well, going to be going on next year. Well, these players most won't be. Well, actually, uh, Las Vegas will have a, a pick in next year's draft, so they'll be. Yes. I think they they said they'll be the equivalent of the third worst uh, team, so they'll have a chance to win the lottery. If if they don't win the lottery, they'll pick like third or fourth in every round. Yeah, I, think, I think that's right. Yep. All right, so NHL Network is launching a new live studio show to go with. They already they already have their the new studio show is going to. Feature EJ Raddick, Steve Mears, and Michelle McMahon is going to host this show weekdays starting at 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, with the 2016-17 season set to begin in eight days. Well, this was a few days ago. It's actually less than that now. NHL Network announced Tuesday that it will expand its live weekday studio program with a new show called NHL Now at 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, Heratic, Mears, and Michelle McMahon are going to be hosting the show. It'll originate from two different NHL Network studios 
and make its debut on opening night of the season, October 12th. With fans gearing up for the night's action, NHL Now will have a fast-paced format that will include arena cam interviews from morning skates around the league, commentary from analysts and correspondents throughout the game, and interviews with players and team personnel. Uh, McMahon, who recently served as Fox Sports Carolina's pregame, uh, and she actually appeared d- between periods a lot too, uh, host of the Hurricanes Live and a ringside reporter, has joined NHL Network and will serve as co-host with Raddick and Mears. And then it lists a whole bunch of other players or former players that are joining NHL Network as well to be occasional contributors to these shows. So now you got the NHL Tonight, which is a nightly program. They've got the what they call the rink, which is uh, a 6 p.m. start, I believe. Mm-hmm. So basically, you're going to see straight programming from four o'clock on every night. Yes, with the NHL Network. Now, M- Michelle McMahon, you you know her, but if you watch yes. any Carolina Hurricanes games, so she tweeted out the day, the day this was announced. She tweeted out to all the Canes fans, thanking us for uh, you know all their support and wishing wishing the Carolina Hurricanes good luck. So, yes, I, I was glad to see that. So that story had a little bit of a, a local flair for us anyway. Okay, Kerry Bubbles has, hi- has been hired as NHL or as Las Vegas' team president. Bill Foley, the owner of the Vegas franchise, said, I'm excited to join the new Las Vegas NHL team to be... Or actually, no. He said this. Okay. Bubbles said, I'm excited to join the new Las Vegas NHL team to be part of building a franchise from, from the start and to work with Bill Foley and George McPhee to create a successful and unforgettable franchise, he told their website. He spent the last 13 years working with the Cleveland Cavaliers of the NBA and the Quicken Loans Arena organization. He served as president of business operations since 2013 and also was president alternate governor for all teams owned by the Cavaliers operating company. So Kerry Bubbles is definitely a business guy. He's not a hockey guy. Right. So he's been brought on to basically run the business of the Las Vegas franchise. Right. Uh, he strikes me as a person that uh, knows about arena, seating capacity, you know, uh, getting fans into the seats. Yep. Uh, probably that type of a guy. Um, yeah, he'll, he, he'll leave the hockey, the on-ice product, to the hockey operations guy. And you see this a lot with teams is they've got a – They've got a business guy and then they've got a hockey operations guy and they, you know, they each have their own responsibilities. So, right. so Las Vegas continues to make headlines. <laughs> Seems like every week they were talking about that team. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good, Christian, man. Christian Erhoff impressed the Bruins so much at the world cup. They decided to give him a tryout contract. Claude Julien, who's, who is one of the assistant coaches for team Canada and the Bruins head coach. Uh, coached against Erhoff and Team Europe in the World Cup final. The 34-year-old defenseman playing without an NHL contract in the tournament had three assists in six games before signing a tryout contract with the Bruins on Friday. Yeah. Uh, he's he's originally from Germany. Uh, he played, He's played 12 seasons, so he's definitely a veteran. He actually has some uh, a lot of playoff experience because he played all those years with uh, Vancouver. Mm-hmm. Um, he had two goals and 10 assists last year in 48 games. For the Kings and Blackhawks, average 15 minutes, 29 seconds of ice time, uh, which is actually his fewest minutes since his rookie season back in 03-04. Right. Um, and of course, you know, he's remembered most by Bruins fans as being on the Vancouver Canucks the year the Bruins beat them uh, in the 2011 Stanley Cup. Interesting to see if he'll, he's still playing, so he hasn't been cut yet. Uh, yeah, that's great. Hope right. he makes it. Yeah, well, I think the Bruins need a guy like him. Their defenseman is lacking, so mm. um, he'll, he'll they'll see if he plays his way onto the lineup. Nicholas Homerson got suspended through the season opener, so he's basically suspended for the rest of the preseason plus one game in the regular season. And uh, he got suspended for hitting St. Louis Blues forward Ty Um, Ratty during an NHL preseason game on Saturday the 1st. I actually watched the uh, video that was released by the uh, Department of Player Safety. And um, yeah, I think he (laughs) deserved the hit. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you know what? I mean, they gave him the suspension. I don't think it's going to hurt the Blackhawks at all. No, I mean, it's one game. And, yeah. and, you know, the, the reason he got suspended was because the check was delivered primarily to his head. And the way he hit him, he kind of went – it was called a charge, a match penalty for a charge. But um, the way he hit him, he basically launched himself into him, 
uh, almost on a kind of a blind side. But, uh, you know, his shoulder was going up as he hit him instead of hitting him in the body. He, he hit him directly in the head. The head. And, and, you, yeah. and you saw Ty Ratty kind of got looked like he got knocked out for a moment or two there. Yes. So the one game suspension will cost Halmerson twenty two thousand seven hundred and seventy seven dollars. Yes. So that money goes into the players emergency assistant fund. So that was it for uh, headlines in the third. We're going back to the first. There wasn't much going on in the second, so we'll go back to the, right. to the first. Uh, Peter Laviolette signed a extension with the Predators, which will keep him the coach, unless he gets fired, of course, uh, with Nashville through the 2020-21 season. So he signed a two-year contract extension to remain, uh, uh, the David Poyle announced. Laviolette, 51, is 88, 52, and 24 in two seasons with the Predators. And they were in the playoffs both years after missing the playoffs in two straight seasons prior to his arrival. I don't think you're going to count all that to him. And yeah, he's a good coach, but they had a lot of developing players too. <laughs> they sure do. He, he, he came in and has presided over the Predators when they, they have flourished. Yep. And it was Barry Trotz who got them there. Yep. But, of course, he's, you know, he's got a Stanley Cup under his belt. He won one in 2006 with the Canes. So, Not taking anything away from him. Yep. He could win the Stanley Cup again this year. He's a great coach. He's a great coach. He's got a lot of experience. Lifetime, he's 477, 30, 334, and 87 uh, in 923 games. So he's got 102 games of playoff experience. Uh, again, he won the Stanley Cup with the Hurricanes, and he actually went to the Cup Final another time and lost to the Blackhawks in six games uh, when he was the Flyers head coach back in 2010. Right. Uh, he's he's made the playoffs eight times as a coach, and uh, he's actually Nashville's second ever coach. Yes, so, as long as so Barry Trotz was uh, uh, the coach for Nashville for a long, long time. He was their original coach. That's right. All right, going back to the thirtieth, uh, Dallas Stars forward Matthias Janmark will miss at least five to six months and possibly the entire NHL season with a joint disorder in his knee. Boy, Dallas is having some major trouble this year with yep. injuries, aren't they? Yep. They are. <laughs> uh, that that one they didn't need. Yeah, Janmark has been diagnosed with osteochondritis desiccans. Boy, I, I clap for you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he had surgery on Friday, uh, General Manager Jim Nils said. Uh, it's I won't even attempt to say it again. That disorder is a joint disorder where bone underneath the cartilage of a joint dies due to lack of blood flow. Bone and cartilage can crack and break loose, resulting in pain, interfering with joint motion. It's a genetic disorder, and chances of a full recovery are 80%, he said. Who cautioned wow. the surgery would reveal a lot more about Jan Mark's long-term prognosis. So he's going to be out a while. So unfortunately, it's it's seems like it's something that uh, he couldn't help, something he was born with. That's that's another blow to uh, the forward crew at Dallas because they've been struggling with uh, Tyler Sagan, although they're saying he'll be back game one. But he's yeah. struggled so far this preseason with some injuries. And, and um, Jamie Benn has also had some trouble. Yep. So, But those two guys should be back at the beginning of the season. So. And then of That's course, what I'm and then of course they lost. Um, uh, you know, they had a, one of their forwards head to the KHL. Nishushkin. Nishushkin. Yep. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't stick around. So so He's Dallas. Playing avant-garde Omsk. Man, I feel good knowing this KHL. Uh, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, oh. so they're hoping for a return in April for Jan Mark. So, uh, but I've got a feeling they'll probably end up just sitting them down for the whole year. Yeah. All right. Back to the 29th. Former player Billy D, Ryan Helmer, and Rob Murray, and executive Doug Yinkst will be inducted to the American League Hockey Hall of Fame at an award ceremony in Allentown, PA on January 30th, 2017. D, a forward, spent 11 of his 19 seasons in professional hockey playing in the AHL. He, he owns the NHL record for playing in 548 straight games for the Buffalo Bisons from 1958 through 1966. Wow, the Buffalo Bisons. So he also has 397 career games in the NHL with the Rangers, Red Wings, and Blackhawks. Of course, yeah, back in those days, it would only be six teams to play for, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yep. He said, and you know, for, seven wasn't Buffalo. I don't know if they were one of the six teams that came on the expansion year of 67 or a year or two right after that. Yeah, it was. Yeah. If it wasn't 67, it was right after that. It might have been with. Yeah. 
Uh, and then, of course, Helmer set career records for AHL defensemen in assists and points during his 20 years with Albany, Worcester, Manitoba, Springfield, Grand Rapids, San Antonio, Hershey, and Oklahoma City. He made seven trips to the conference finals, won three Calder Cup championships. He also has 146 games of NHL experience with the Coyotes, Blues, Canucks, and Capitals. Now, the yeah. third guy, Murray, played 15 seasons in the AHL and ranks third in league history with 20. 20- 940 penalty minutes in 1,018 oh. games. Boy, that's that's almost three minutes a game. His <laughs> face, amazing. his face must look he- terrible. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's straight out of slap shot, Wayne. <laughs> he's one of the Hanson brothers. If you're averaging three penalty minutes a game, you're getting in a fight every other game, <laughs> and then a minor somewhere in there too. Yeah. He served as captain in Moncton, Springfield, Hamilton, and Philadelphia. Murray also played in 107 NHL games with the Capitals, Jets, and Coyotes. Yinks spent 34 years as an executive with the Hershey Bears. Uh, He was hired as director of sales and promotion in 1982. He won the AHL Ken McKenzie Award for outstanding promotion in in 87-88 when Hershey won the Calder Cup. He was promoted to assistant GM in 88 and added the role of director of hockey operations in 90. He won four Calder Cup titles and eight trips to the finals, tied for the most by anyone in AHL history. And uh, Hershey Bears, I want to add to that, uh, that long history of success in the AHL. Even the today. Most, wouldn't you say the most the most successful team in the AHL history? Probably. I wouldn't. I don't know exactly who's how many teams have won, uh, uh, you know, the Calder Cup, but um, I know the Hershey Bears win it quite often, and they've actually won it recently. Uh, they yep. weren't they weren't the winner last year, but I think the two previous seasons they won. I could be wrong, but I agree. So, so I wanted to add that in there for uh, for you American Hockey League fans. Uh, now, yeah. there's one other story we didn't touch on last week that I do want to touch on this week. Uh, Walter Bush, a founder of the Minnesota North Stars and a key figure in, in USA hockey. Uh, died last week. Uh, he was 86. Uh, Bush was inducted to the Hockey Hall of Fame in 2000. Uh, he was a native of Minneapolis and was inducted to the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame in 1980. Uh, the IIHF Hall of Fame in 2009. He won the Lester Patrick Trophy in 1973 for his contributions to the sport in the United States. Uh, he played a large role in the addition of women's hockey to the Olympics in 1998. Um, so he was a huge figure in USA hockey. In fact, when I first started playing as a kid, he was the president of uh, what is now known USA Hockey. Back then, it was uh, it was we we referred to it as a house amateur hockey um, amateur hockey association of the United States. It was a house, uh, and he was the president back then when I was a kid. So, um, yeah. and he was instrumental, of course, in um, putting together the dream or the, uh, the, uh, 1980 Olympic team, yes. the miracle on ice team. Yes. You know, I remember, I just remember, and I really miss, I'm an old fogey, I guess on this, but, uh, I really miss the Minnesota North stars. You know, that was his team. And, uh, you know, Dino Cicerelli, the whole nine yards, they were a great team to watch. And man, they had the fans too, you know, and great unis, man. They had great uniforms. Uh, that's what I remember about Walter Bush. Yep. And he, he, of course, moved the team to Dallas. I mean, that was, I think he sold the team, actually, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I could be wrong on that, Wayne. Okay. But uh, he, he uh, you know, he was responsible and oversaw the, uh, the movement of the team from Minnesota to Dallas. I think that would be more accurate. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, we did want to touch on that. We didn't want that one overlooked. Um, okay. Well, that's it for pretty much scores, headlines, news going around the league. So why don't we go on to our next segment, which is uh, we're going to now the last four weeks, we gave you team previews for each team in the NHL. Uh, This week, we want to go ahead and put down officially uh, draw our line in the sand, so to speak, on who we think is going to win uh, basically everything this year. (laughs) That <laughs> so what that we'll do exciting. what we'll what we'll do is we'll go ahead and start with picking um well we picked our well we'll review our our 16 teams that are going to make the playoffs and then we'll go from there sounds good all right so do you want to go ahead and start you want me to start I, how do you want to do it i'll be glad to go first all and, right uh, get mine out of the way in the playoffs in the east out of the metropolitan division i have pittsburgh winning washington finning, finishing second the New York Rangers finishing third, and the Philadelphia Flyers finishing fourth. And in the Atlantic Division, 
I have the Tampa Bay Lightning finishing first, the Florida Panthers finishing second, the Montreal Canadiens finishing third, and the Detroit Red Wings finishing fourth. The playoff teams out of the West in the Central, I have Nashville, the Predators winning the division, Dallas finishing second, Chicago finishing third, and St. Louis finishing fourth. And then in the Pacific Division, I have San Jose winning the title, the Los Angeles Kings finishing second, the Anaheim Ducks finishing third, and the uh, Edmonton Oilers finishing fourth. All right. Uh, All right. You want me to keep going? Nope, we'll, okay. we'll pause. I'll go down through my playoffs. Now, I don't have what I picked in previous episodes in front of me, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to do something a little bit different, and I'm just going to go ahead and pick what I think right now is going to happen because, uh, you know, obviously these things change from day to day. It's fluid, but I'll set it in stone right now what, we're gonna, what I think is going to happen. Um, I've got Washington running away again with the uh, the East or the the Metropolitan, uh, with Pittsburgh finishing uh, second right now. I've got Philadelphia third, Rangers fourth in okay. the Atlantic. I've got Tampa Bay first, Montreal second. I almost forgot about Montreal. Uh, Florida third, Boston fourth. I gotta pick. I gotta pick the Bruins. There you go. Gotta pick the Bruins. I think they will. They they stand a good chance of making the playoffs. As I told you, I think it's gonna be a dogfight between Detroit, Boston, and uh, one other team. It's uh, Buffalo. And I see Detroit missing the playoffs for the first time in 25 years. You may very well be right, I'm, Wayne. I'm calling that now. <laughs> All right, let's move to the Western Conference. In the Central Division, I've got Dallas uh, winning the division. Despite our injury issues, I've got Dallas first. I've got Nashville second, Chicago third, St. Louis fourth in the Western. And I've got Minnesota in fifth, and they're going to make the playoffs. Okay, so you got five teams coming out of the Central. Out of the Central, yep. Out of the Pacific, I've got Anaheim, San Jose, and Edmonton. Wow. And I think LA is going to miss the playoffs. Wow. Just just yeah. a hunch of some of the stuff I'm hearing coming out of LA lately. I think I think they're going to struggle this year. Very interesting. All right, so what we'll go ahead and do it and... and Next, we'll go ahead and talk about uh, what we think is going to happen in the first round. So now we obviously need to seed our teams. Right. One through eight. Right. And we'll try to follow the format that the NHL is using. Keeping so in like, for example, in my case where I've got five teams coming out of the central, I've got to drop Minnesota down into the Pacific bracket. Right. As the four seed in Minnesota or in the in the Pacific, rather than try to do wild cards and you got teams crossing over from one to the other. We'll just assume that the fourth place team in each division, uh, if you've got four coming out of each division, has the fourth seed in that bracket. Okay. All right. We'll just make things easier on everybody. So um, so I'll go ahead and start with mine and you can pick it up. From there. Okay. So in the in the central division bracket, I've got Dallas with the first seed playing uh, St. Louis as the number four, and I've got Dallas winning that series. And then in the other matchup in that bracket, Nashville versus Chicago, I'm going to pick Nashville knocking off Chicago in the first round. Wow. Again, that'll be a hell of a series if that happens in the first round. Oh, that will be. Yeah. And now in the Pacific bracket, we I've got Anaheim with the one seed playing Minnesota as the number four. And I've got Anaheim running through that one. And I've got San Jose beating Edmonton. San, San Jose beating Edmonton in the other matchup in that bracket. Yeah. Now, Edmonton will make the playoffs, but they got to learn how to win in the playoffs. So I if they do make the playoffs, they'll be quickly ousted in my in my mind. Yeah. Now, moving over to the east. I've got Washington having to play the Rangers in the first round. And sorry, Steve, but I think Washington's going to run through the Rangers again. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. In that one. Okay. Well, the Rangers had to play Pittsburgh last year in the first round. This this year, I think they're going to end up having to play Washington. And then in the other matchup, we've got a Pittsburgh-Philly all-PA matchup, which is going to be an absolute war if they play each other. And uh, Pittsburgh will win that one. Now over to the Atlantic, I've got Tampa Bay playing Boston in the first round, and I've got Tampa Bay winning that one fairly easily. And Montreal is going to knock off Florida on the back of Carey Price getting red hot. (laughs) Carey Price standing on his head. Yep. And Shea Weber zinging those wild, (laughs) massive 
pucks he has on the power play right by yep. the uh, watching eyes of Roberto Luongo. So to recap, I've got advancing into the second round. I've got Dallas, Nashville, Anaheim, San Jose in the West, Washington, Pittsburgh, Tampa Bay, Montreal in the East. Very good. Well, let's see. I'll try the same type of thing. All right. Uh, in the playoffs in the East, I've got Pittsburgh in the first round playing the Philadelphia Flyers, and I as well picked Pittsburgh to win that. I had a 2-3 matchup with the Washington uh, Capitals and the Rangers. But now, Wayne, I'll tell you, uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm really never concerned about the confidence of our team when we play the Washington Capitals. Uh, we have beat them more times than they've beat us in recent years in the playoffs. And it's always a welcome sign when the Rangers play the, the uh, Capitals. It's always a good series. But we seem to do very well against them. That's a team that I think we can beat. So I'm picking the Rangers to win in the first round of the playoffs and go to the second round. Oh, wow. Yep. That is bold. Yep. In the Atlantic, I've got Tampa Bay playing number uh, first of all against Detroit, and I think Tampa Bay will win that. And then the 2-3 matchup is Florida against Montreal, and I as well believe that Montreal is going to win that and move into the second round. Yep. Uh, in the West... I've got uh, Nashville playing in the first round against St. Louis. I don't think they'll have any trouble. I think Nashville is going to go to the second round this year, and I, I think they're going to do it in style. Uh -huh. uh, I, 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 the the, the, se the uh, second series, Dallas and Chicago, I think Chicago uh, is going to win that. I, I don't think Dow Dallas is like the Washington of the East. Uh, they choke in the playoffs, and I mean, maybe they maybe they'll pull through. But I think by the time the playoffs roll around, all cylinders are going to be clicking with the with the Blackhawks, and they'll be ready uh, to take care of things. Yeah, uh, I think in, I think if Chicago plays Dallas, I agree with you. Chicago will advance. Yeah. In the Pacific, I've got San Jose and playing Edmonton in the first round, and I echo what you said completely. Edmonton has to learn how to win in the playoffs. I it might be a good series, but I think San Jose is going to win. Yep. And then my 2-3 matchup is the Los Angeles Kings, which I can't believe you, you've got not even making the playoffs, but that may happen. Uh, Los Angeles against Anaheim, and I have the Anaheim Ducks winning that. Cool. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to our conference finalists. I've got, I've got uh, Dallas playing Nashville in the second round, and I think da uh, Nashville is actually going to advance – this year i think this is a team that's been put together they're finally going to learn how to win and i think they're going to move on to the conference final and in the other series we're facing another anaheim san jose and i think san jose now that they've figured out what it takes to get at least to the cup final they're going to continue to roll and i think they're going to beat anaheim very interesting yep in the east the first matchup i've got is washington pittsburgh and i think washington is going to upset Pittsburgh, despite Pittsburgh having all this playoff experience. I think Washington. I think Washington has failed enough in the playoffs. They're finally going to learn how to uh, beat some teams this year. Wow! Uh, and then in the other bracket, we've got Tampa Bay playing Montreal, and Tampa Bay is scary good. I really think they are, and I think they're going to knock off Montreal. Won't be easy. Because they got to beat Carey Price, but I think Tampa yep. Bay is going to knock them off. Very interesting. Very interesting. I tell you what, mine are different altogether. I've got Pittsburgh playing the Rangers, and I think Pittsburgh is going to win that series again. I think with Sidney Crosby and Malkin is going to have a bigger year than he did last year. Uh, Kessel, there, there are just so many weapons on that team. Um, I just don't, don't know that the Rangers, the Rangers may may suffer from a couple years now of having to play them early on in the playoffs, first or second round. And, uh, you know, I, I'm going with my head and not my heart. Yep. Tampa Bay against Montreal. I believe Tampa Bay will win that series, although that series I could be wrong on. I would not be surprised at all if, if Carey Price is playing as well as he's capable of and you and I have seen. I would not be surprised at all if Montreal wins that series. But I'm picking Tampa Bay because, as you said, they just have too many weapons. They're loaded, and they have a great goalie. Yep. Uh, so I'm picking a, a conference finals in the east of Pittsburgh versus Tampa Bay. In the west, the Nashville-Chicago series, I think Chicago is going to win. I really think Chicago is going to, again, get once they get to the second round, 
uh, they, they're they're going to play Nashville. I think it's going to be an all-out war. But I think Chicago is going to figure it out this time. And and instead of what happened last year, I think they're going to turn the tables on Nashville and win. And then the other uh, so, uh, sem- conference semifinal is San Jose against Anaheim. I picked the San Jose Sharks to win that, setting up a conference final of Chicago versus San Jose. All right. So go ahead and take it the next round further. Next, next round further, again, I'm picking Pittsburgh to win in the East. I just I just think when it comes down to it, um, Pittsburgh has the veteran leadership. They have Sidney Crosby. Um, I just see them as, and with Kessel, they, they, they just complete a, a, a great picture, a great team. And with the coaching, too, uh, of Mike Sullivan, Pittsburgh's going to move on. And Chicago versus uh, San Jose, I think the San Jose Sharks are going to repeat a trip to the Stanley Cup. So I think it's going to be a repeat of last year's Stanley Cup. That's wow. what I have. Wow. Wow. Yep. That yep. is bold because you don't yep. see that happen very often. No, you don't. Yep. All right. So what I've got going to the conference, again, I've got Nashville playing San Jose in the conference final. And I agree with you. I think San Jose is ultimately going to uh, go back to the conference final for one final time. I think this is it, though, for them. Uh, They've got some guys that are getting up there in age. And uh, if it's not going to happen this year, I don't think it's going to happen for them, um, at least in the foreseeable future. Yeah, I Uh, agree with you. So I've got San Jose coming out of the West once again this year. But in the East, I don't have Pittsburgh, obviously. that had them eliminated in the, in the uh, second round. Uh, I've got Washington, Tampa Bay competing in the conference final. And this time around, I've got Tampa Bay breaking wow. through to the conference final. They are going to knock off Washington. So, But that series is going to be a fun one to watch. There's a lot, of, a lot of speed, a lot of offensive talent on both teams both Washington and Tampa Bay. Yeah, you're and, not kidding. Uh, and I think Tampa Bay will finally uh, uh, break through the conference final on that one. And my, <coughs> I'll go ahead and take the next step, and we're down to our Stanley Cup final between San Jose and Tampa Bay. And I am going to go way out there and say that San Jose is going to get it done this year. Wow. And win you the Stanley and I Cup. Agree. Do we? <laughs> I pick the San Jose Sharks to win the Stanley Cup this year. Yep. The hockey News won't agree with us. They're picking Tampa Bay to win it all. Are they really? Yep. I just think with, with Tampa Bay, there's so many moving parts. They got a talented team, but, you know, uh, they just, I don't know. Uh, they, they, oh, heck, they could win the Stanley Cup. They are definitely one of the best five teams teams and one of the top teams to win the Stanley Cup. Yep. But it's so many intangibles come into play <laughs> in this uh, Stanley Cup playoffs that I just don't know. Yep. Okay. Well, so. now that we've made our bold predictions for uh, how the the league is going to lay out this year, and we'll come back to it as we get closer to the playoffs to see how close we were, let's uh, go ahead and move on to some of the individual awards. Right. Uh, and and make our picks for some of the different, we're not going to do them all, but some of the major ones that are out there. Obviously, we'll start with the Hart Trophy. Who have you got winning the Hart Trophy this year? Steven Stamkos. Interesting. Yep. Interesting. I've got, yep. J- I've got uh, Jamie Benn winning it. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, that out of Dallas. Bad. Yeah, he very well could. So, of course, that's that's, that's based on regular season performance. So that's right. They don't uh, <coughs> they don't consider playoffs for the for the Hart Trophy. Although right. the, although they they probably should. But mm-hmm. anyway, um, well, actually, going back to the playoffs. Speaking of playoffs, who do you think is going to win the Conn Smythe? Conn Smythe, I got Joe Pavelski. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, could be Joe Thornton. But I I picked Pavelski because he's a goal scorer. In fact, uh, one of the what the second or the. Th- He's got the second or the third most goals in the NHL in the last, I don't know, five or six years. He's uh, way up there. So I'm going with the easy choice. I'm picking Martin Jones. Oh, okay. Well, you know, <laughs> if they get that far, he could very well yep. be the guy that gets him there. So I, yep. that doesn't surprise me. Yep. All right. So speaking of goalies, let's move on to the Vesna Trophy. Okay. Who have you got winning that? You're, you're going to be shy. I picked Henrik. Oh, wow. That's why. Okay. Henrik Lundqvist has won at least 30 games in 10 of his 11 seasons with the Rangers. He has been nominated for for the Vesna six times. He's won it once. He should have won it twice. He should have won it the year Bobrovsky won it, but he was robbed of the of the trophy that year. But I I think uh, he's going to have I I really believe Henrik is going to have another great year and he's going to have 30 some 30 some odd wins. And if the Rangers, uh, if he if he gets up to the upper 30s, 37, 38, 40 wins, 
it'll it'll come down to you know him against uh you know another another guy probably maybe two but um i just think with that many wins and based on his track record it's going to it's going to stick in the minds of sports writers you know marty brodeur won it you one year and he didn't have the best record yep. uh, i'm not saying that henrik is going to make the hall of fame yet but uh he, you know if he's in, if he's a finalist again he may very well win it yeah, hey, hey, you know, he is one of the elite goalies in the league, so it's certainly a reasonable choice. Yeah. I've got Braden Holpe winning. Yeah, it. winning it again. Yep, yep. Well. I think, uh, you know, and I, it was a toss-up for me between him and Carey Price, but you know what? Carey Price play, plays for Montreal, and I hate Montreal, so I'm, <laughs> so I'm not going to go with Carey Price. I'm going to go with somebody else. So I've got I've got Holpe. That's why I made I, that choice. <laughs> I completely understand that, Wayne. I understand that with my head and my heart. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, who do you have winning the Art Ross? Steven Stamkos. Interesting. Yeah, I, yeah, I got Steven Stamkos. That's the most points, right? Yep. I've got Steven Stamkos winning that that trophy. Okay. I've got um and I, you know I thought about that one. I've got Tyler Sagan winning it. Oh, wow. Because if Jamie yeah. Ben, if Jamie Ben is going to win the uh, Hart Trophy for the league's MVP, he can't do that without help. Yeah. And Sagan, Sagan gets a lot of assists for you know Jamie Ben scores a lot of goals. So, and uh, Sagan assists on a lot of them, and he's a good playmaker. And I think, uh, and of course, he can score too. So I think Sagan will uh, win the points championship this year. Very, very interesting, Wayne. Yep. And of course, that assumes he's healthy. Yeah. But of course we're assuming everybody's healthy in this list these lists. That's right. All right. Now, as far as the Rocket Richard trophy, which is the award for most goals, I'm going to change it up a little bit. You're not allowed to vote for Alex Ovechkin. Yeah, I, it, I did not vote I did not put down Alex Ovechkin. Cuz it's pretty clear that he's probably the biggest, you know, the the, the I mean, he's won that trophy several times now. Yeah. Uh, so you got to pick somebody other than him. So go ahead. Yeah. Vladimir Tarasenko. Tarasenko. Let's, yeah. I mean, he got 40 goals last year, so. Yeah, and I see him. And remember, David Backus left St. Louis, so they're going to need uh, offensive production from somebody who's going to step up, and God, Vladimir Tarasenko is going to do that. He's a great player. Maybe yep. the best stick handler in the league. What do you think, Wayne? Hey, he's definitely up there. I mean, now that uh, um, now that Pavel Datsuk's gone from Detroit. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Somebody's yeah. got to be that the Mr. Hands guy, and he's yep. he's up there, so. I've got Patrick Kane winning it. Oh wow! Okay, this year that's a good one. Yeah. That's a very good one. He had 46 last year, so and he yeah. was neck and neck with Ovechkin all year long. I think uh, if Ovechkin doesn't win it, which uh, you know is 50-50 shot, he probably will. I think Kane will be right up there with him. Wow! All right, how about Calder Trophy? This one's a little uh, interesting. This would, this would be your Rookie of the Year essentially. Yep. I bet you I have the same one you do. I wouldn't be surprised. Patrick Lane. Nope. I got Austin Matthews. <laughs> oh, you do? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I think it's going to come down between. And again, we're talking about something that depends on injuries. Remember last year, Connor McDavid got hurt. Otherwise, yep. I think he would have won the call. He probably, he probably would have won it. Yep. Um, you know, so, uh, but yeah, I, I picked Lane. I think Lane's, uh, I, I don't know. I just think he's going to flourish. Yep. Agreed. Um, but yeah, I've got, I've got Matthews. So they, we go, we gone one, two on the, in terms of draft order anyway, going for the Calder. Yeah. All right. Now this will be an interesting the rocket Richard again. I picked Patrick Kane, Patrick Kane. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. Now let's talk Norris trophy. One of my favorite trophies. Yep. Best defenseman. Yep. Duncan Keith. Okay. Has he won it before? Twice. He has. Okay. Yeah. I, I haven't kept up uh, the last several years. Who's won it? Because once once Chara stopped winning it, I kind of lost track of who won it after that. Yeah. If Eric Carlson isn't, if he is not the best defenseman in the league, Eric Carlson is. I really think those are the two best defensemen playing in the NHL today. And uh, a case could be made for either one of them. Eric Carlson, in my mind, is the best offensive defenseman in the league, without a doubt. I agree with you. But there's always that knock on him that he sometimes he sacrifices defensive play to to um, you know go on the offense, which right. for the team he plays for he almost has no choice. There's limited options for him uh, on that team in Ottawa. So that's right. You're gonna be surprised by my choice. No, I bet you I'm not. I bet I can pick who it is. <laughs> All right. <laughs> who do you think I'm gonna pick? Roman it's, Yossi. It's not Chara. Roman Yossi. No, same team. PK Subban. 
You picking PK, huh? I'm picking PK. Yep. I think he's gonna have a huge year. Wow. They're, they're gonna let him do what he wants to do, and I think he's gonna he's gonna It wouldn't wouldn't surprise me at all, Wayne. That yep. that's a great pick. Yep. I think he's going to have a huge year. And and it's not that I picked Subban because uh because Weber plays for Montreal. I think Subban actually will will outplay uh Weber offensively anyway for sure. Yeah. But that's my bold prediction of the individual awards. All right. In terms of Jack Adams, which would be essentially your coach of the year. Right. I picked Todd McClellan, Edmonton Oilers. Not a bad choice. Yeah. Not a bad choice. I actually had him as well. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah. Because Obviously, we're, we both picked Edmonton to make the playoffs for the first time in umpteen years, so that would automatically make him a good choice. Right. Very, very good. So Cool. Well, that's all the ones we're going to do at this point. There's a bunch of other ones out there, but they're all, you know, they're all not as, uh, not as, um, uh, doesn't get the press that these, these big ones have, so. I agree. That was a lot of fun, Wayne. That I was. really enjoyed that. So we'll have to revisit this at the end of the year to see how we did in our predictions. Let's revisit it. I agree. <laughs> Halfway through and then at the end. So we'll have to make a note. Yep. Okay. So let's move on to our KHL Minute. Um, did you have a story you wanted to lead off with? Sure. I'd be glad to. All right. My KHL Minute occurred on October the 1st. 2016, when Metallurge Novokuznetsk played Metallurge Magnitogorsk, who, as you know, is the number one team in the NHL. They've won the Gagarin Cup the last two years in a row, yep. and they're poised to win it again this year. They're, they're off to a great again, start. Yeah. Great team. Uh, but Magnitogorsk lost this game. Novokuznetsk won 5-4 to four in a shootout, and despite three goals from all-time goal scorer Sergei Mozyakin, uh, Metal Urge, who had a 4-1 to lead in the game, was able to hold on and win the game, breaking an eight-game winning streak and in the process ending Magnitogorsk's five-game winning streak. All right. And that, that brought me up to this point, Wayne, uh, in, in, and it's in regards, we, you and I talked about this, the parity in the K KHL is much, much less than it is in the NHL. Yeah, uh, I see it, and of course, granted, they got a team from from uh, from uh, Beijing starting out, and I think there's another team that doesn't play many games, but th there's just not nearly the parity that exists in the NHL, where you uh, you know you have most of the teams you know can get up to the 70, 80 point mark. Yep, uh, you're not going to see that with this league. Well, you know, you know, one thing that I noticed when I was look, you know, in, in following this league for a little bit that we have, I've noticed that um, and I've and I've seen reports that the draft for this league is a little bit more um, a bit of a I don't know what you want to call it. It's kind of a I don't know. It's it's not the kind of draft like the you know NHL teams are trying to pick the best players that they can possibly find. Right. Right. The KHL, when they go through the draft, there's very much a geographic component to it. Uh, okay. If you look at some of the different teams, uh, like the, the Jokerit team out of Finland, for example. Yep. If you look at their team, they have a considerably more Finnish players playing on that team than or the majority of the players on their team are Finnish. Right. And you see that in some of the other teams that are, there's, uh, I believe there's a team playing out of the Czech Republic, too that has yeah. vast majority of their team is checks. Zagreb. Yeah. So you see that the, the players playing for the different teams tend to be from the area that those teams are playing from as well. Okay. So, and I think that's why we're seeing a, a big range. So the teams that, that are based around the bigger cities like Moscow and, and St. Petersburg and those areas, those teams are going to be strong year in and year out because they're picking from the a, be a better a better pool of players whereas the teams further away or uh, you know from other countries they may or may not be able to compete because of the players that they have access to that's very interesting very good point so uh, you know so, Helsinki might have a good year and then they then they might not have the same pool of players that someone from St. Petersburg or, or Moscow right would definitely right so there's very much a geographic component to their draft which makes it a little bit less more of a formality more than anything than mm -hmm. than an actual true draft. Right. Because you, you, if they were doing that, you would see a more mix, um, kind of like what you see in the NHL where, you know, 50% Canadian, 30% American, and then uh, 20% European. It seems to be across the board on NHL teams. Right. So, well, my KHL minute was another game on October 1st. Uh, the, the Chinese team, you, you spoke of them earlier, 
uh, the Hunlun Red, what do they call themselves? The Red Star. The, yeah, the Kunlun Red Star uh, got their first ever KHL shutout. Oh, I saw that, yeah. Yep, and they're also talking about, uh, and in that game, the first Chinese eligible player, meaning the first player that would be eligible to play for a Chinese national team, um, got his first point. Zach Yuan yes. got his first point. He's actually Canadian trained, but he's he's a dual citizen, Canada, China. And he's playing yeah. for this Kunlin team under the Chinese flag. And he got an assist in that game uh, to become the first Chinese eligible player to get a point in the KHL. That's great. That's yep. really great. And of course, Andre, it was a one nothing game. So goalie Andre Makarov. Uh, got the shutout in that game. Yeah, I see in the notes in you the, put he was truly a great wall. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was copied verbatim right from the KHL website. <laughs> Make no lies. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was a one nothing shutout over Moscow Spartak. So very good. So there's my minute. And and I also wanted to note too that uh, the SKA Saint Petersburg and as CSKA Moscow, which is the old Red Army team are both off to uh, really hot starts and are dominating the league right now. Uh, St. Petersburg is 11-1-4, and and CSK Moscow is 13-2-2 uh, and to start the year. So um, yeah. so both teams are are expected to do well every year. And like we said, you know they, they have some geographical advantages that other teams don't have. And, uh, and of course, the CSK Moscow... Uh, or also known as the old Red Army team, is kind of like the Montreal Canadiens of that league. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to play for them. So. Right. All right. So Very good. let's move on to our new NCAA segment. I mentioned last week I wanted to talk a little bit of college hockey each week, and I'm definitely going to lead that discussion because um, you know I went to an NCAA Division I school, so I'm, uh, and I've continued to follow college hockey since going to school there. I went to school at Maine. And um, so college hockey is near and dear to my heart. And um, most teams got underway last weekend. Uh, most teams played exhibition games only. But I'm just noting that the college hockey season has begun. And almost every team in the country had a game, mostly against Division II, Division III, uh, amateur junior teams, and Canadian colleges. Uh, all of which don't count in the in the um, well. They use they use a pairwise ranking, is what they call it in NCAA, to determine which teams make it ultimately to the 16 team NCAA tournament that happens at the end of the year. So their pairwise ranking is the big huge number that all the teams look at uh, on where they are. And games against Division Two, II, Division Three junior teams and Canadian colleges don't count in those pairwise standings. Mm -hmm. So, and most teams this weekend had games. Um, they were against those uh, schools that aren't part of NCAA division one. So, and my main black bears did have a game. They lost, where's the score of that game? They lost six to five to St. Francis Xavier. Uh, it was a home game on Sunday. Oh yeah. So, that was my NCAA minute. So if you're a college hockey fan uh, and the games this weekend are going to most teams that are playing games do play against other Division One schools. So you're going to yes. start seeing games that count starting this coming weekend. And that yes. would be the weekend, uh, the eighth and the ninth. And, and college hockey, Steve, I don't know if you're aware, but most college hockey teams play Friday, Saturday night games. And during the week, they're in class, so they don't have general. Generally, they don't have games. You you will see a few, you know, weeknight games and a few Sunday games. But the vast majority of the college hockey season is played on Friday and Saturday nights. Yes. All right. Uh, so so let's go ahead and move on to our picks of the week. Yes, sir. I can start out with mine if you'd like. Go ahead. I'm shifting off of the uh, sentimental uh, stories this week to give it a little change. <laughs> But you know that that uh, that is liable to crop up again for a few weeks. That's uh, that's just how I am. But uh, I I want to say that uh, my pick of the week is uh, collegehockeynews.com. Uh, I use them quite extensively to study up and bone up on the NCAA. Uh, I've followed the NCAA for the last two or three years now, and each year it seems I'm spending more and more time uh, learning about the divisions and the teams. Uh, but College Hockey News is a great uh, great resource. Um, if you don't know about college hockey, and if you do, uh, of course, it's a great way to keep in touch. Scores, division races, teams, 
uh, the rankings as well as great articles that cover all aspects of NCAA Division Number One uh, men's ice hockey and Division Three as well. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's a good site. I've used I've used it many many times. There's also another one that's actually a little bit older, and I think they're celebrating their 20th year this year. Is uscollegehockeyonline.com. That's another yes. that's another uh, good resource for college hockey news in the U.S. So I would love to see the college hockey gr- game grow as much as uh, college football, college um, basketball has here in the U.S. Um, it's obviously it's going to lag behind anyway because college football and basketball, you know, the sports are more popular here in the U.S. than hockey is. Um, but college hockey, I don't think, gets the attention enough attention. It's it's so true, Wayne, and it's it is very very exciting. Uh, I I really I, I want to make this point. I think when you get these sixty four teams or whatever it is that go into the NCAA men's college basketball tournament, you're going to see uh, you rarely see the upset in the first few rounds of a major team. Most of the time, they'll run right through to the Sweet Sixteen. It, it happens just about every year. Yep. Uh, you know, the Kentuckys, uh, the, the uh, Carolinas, yep. the Dukes, yep. they, they perennially make it. But when you're playing in a low-scoring game like hockey is, anything can happen when you make it to the uh, 16 teams that make it. Don't I the, know it. <laughs> it, it? It happens every year. There's major upsets in the first round or two. Yep. It happens all the time. And tiny Union College in Schenectady, New York – Won the national championship three years ago with Matt Bodie and those guys, yep. and it it's it can happen. A major upset can happen, and a team get to the Frozen Four that you don't think about, and all of a sudden in one game the goalie stands on his head and they win. It, yep. So it, it's very exciting. Yeah, and and college hockey uses the same format that college basketball is one and done, and yep. in hockey it's much more unpredictable than basketball is. I agree with you there, and as a University of Maine. Um, fan, I know firsthand that it can be good and bad. Uh, like for example, Maine's won, uh, two national titles. Uh, the first one was in 93. They dominated college hockey all year, uh, went into the tournament with only one loss on the entire year. And they went to overtime twice in that tournament and they could have bounced either way. They could have been knocked out, you know, having only one loss all season. Right. And then in 99, they won the national championship again and they weren't expected. They were, they were expected to be good enough to make the tournament, but they weren't expected to be good enough to win the tournament. But they got a hot goalie, Alfie Michaud, and he stood on his head for, uh, four games and they went out and basically, you know, surprised the world. And, and I mean, granted at the, in those days, Maine was a perennial powerhouse. So it wasn't a shock by any stretch, right? but, but that season they weren't expected to win. They were, they were right around at 10, 11, 12 in the rankings all year long and then came out of nowhere and won the, won the thing. So, <laughs> and that me. and that championship game too was an overtime game. Yeah. So and that could have gone either way. And then there were times Maine's been in in the national title game uh, three other times, I believe. They've been in the national championship game five times, and and were favored in a couple of them and lost. So yeah, college hockey. Once you getting to the tournament is most of the battle, and then anything That's can right. happen from there. And it's only 16 teams. There's 60, uh, 60 teams in Division One right now, and uh, only 16 make it to the national tournament. That's right. So most of the season, and they play 30-some games, uh, you know, it counts for something. Yep. You have to have a great year. You have to be doing good uh, pair-wise uh, near the end of the season to have any chance of getting into the, the final 16 teams. And it's it's really uh, – they can kind of tell you who's going to make the tournament before it's ever uh, really – I mean, yeah, the, way, the way the coaches generally look at it, if you're not in the top 12 in the pairwise, uh, you're probably not going to make the tournament because they also have automatic bids. So there's six divisions, and the six division winners, the, the tournament winners, uh, make, right. it, make it to the championship – or make it to the NCAA. They get the automatic bids. Right. So every once in a while or every year, there always seems to be one or two teams that come from the depths of the of the standings win yeah. win the conference tournament. Northeastern last year. 
Yeah. Hockey East. Right. Because all these conference tournaments um, are all generally one and done uh, as well. So, so essentially the playoffs start at the start of the conference tournament. And, you know, a team can, can come out of nowhere like Northeastern and win the tournament, grab one of the, the uh, automatic bids, which will knock one of the teams that are out or near the 13, 14, 15 in the pairwise. Those teams get knocked out because of this team that came out of nowhere to win the uh, conference championship. So, um, so the coaches generally try to say, okay, well, if you're, if you're 12 or up in the pairwise, you're in pretty good shape to get an at-large bid. Right. But below 12, you're on the bubble and, and can be knocked out uh, by one of these uh, come-out-of-nowhere teams. So it's it's exciting. It makes every game count. It really there's, does. There's no, there's no um, yeah, there's no nights that you can take off in, in college hockey. That, that's right. And, of course, these guys aren't being paid, so they're playing for the love of the game. That's exactly right, Wayne. <laughs> and for and the eyeballs passion, of scouts. The <laughs> passion of the fans, it is every bit as passionate as the NHL, if not more so in some cases. You take a look at the bean pot. That is about as passionate as you're going to get yeah. in hockey. Yeah, and I can tell you the fans at Maine are uh, – I've, I've been in games in at the University of Maine in their home building – uh, at Alphon Arena. It's only 5,400 seats in that rink, but I've never experienced the loudness from a crowd that I've experienced in that rink. And part of it, and part of it is the design of the rink, the roof structure. The roof is very, very low. Um, the roof over the stands anyway is very, very low. And so the crowd noise essentially bounces off the roof. It's a wood roof. And that noise wow. bounces off the roof and is directed, almost directed onto the ice. And there's been nights there where it was so loud my ears were ringing when I went home that night. <laughs> that is great, Wayne. And, and the only thing that's ever come close to that for me in terms of the amount of noise was uh, playoff. the time I went to a playoff game, Boston Bruins against Carolina Hurricanes back in 2009. My ears were ringing that night when I went home because the Hurricanes won the game. So. Yeah. <laughs> So that so the so the uh, PNC Arena was very very loud that night. Yeah, that's awesome. So yeah, love college hockey, love the atmosphere, and I would love to have the opportunity to take you up to Maine sometime and take you to a game to, it, uh, to show I would, you. I would love to do that. <laughs> I I would love to do that to show you. I ha I have kind of a bucket list uh, thing where where um, I would love at some point in my life to just get an RV, rent it, whatever, and just travel the country, just visiting as many rinks as we can over a course of a season. Yeah. That would be something I'd love to do. <laughs> be a blast. Man, yeah. That'd be a blast. <laughs> uh, the problem for me is money, of course. But Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but for a weekend or something to go up to Maine, oh, it, I'd, it'd be so good. I'd, I'd really enjoy that. Yeah, but hey, you see people doing Kickstarters all the time for stuff like this. Maybe we should do a Kickstarter where we – we raise money and we'll, in return for people funding our Kickstarter, um, we'll we'll do a daily vlog for all the people that are uh, <laughs> that are following us around the country, going from rink to rink to rink. We can go visit all the NHL, AHL, college rinks. We I think we can visit most of them in the course of a whole season. Oh yeah, our wives would hate us because we'd be gone for six months. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> such is the life of a hockey fan. I, I know, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, my pick of the week, uh, moving on, is an article I came across, and it was very interesting. It was on the uh, Hockey News website, article written by Ken Campbell, one of the Hockey News writers. Uh, the, the article is titled, World Cup Selling Ice Water for $65. Unbelievable. S seriously. And I'll, and I'll just read the first paragraph or so from the article, and then if you want to read the rest of it, it's pretty funny. Uh, you can go to the Hockey News. There's a link to the article on the, in the show notes for the episode. Uh, you can go there and read the whole article for yourself. But here it goes. It says, if you're, if you're looking for DNA from some of the best hockey players in the world, you might want to consider dropping a few bucks on a crystal puck. Nothing really says growing the game like charging 65 bucks uh, for a few drops of Zamboni water, does it? Just when you thought the folks are bringing us a world crash grab of hockey had run out of ways to make revenues. And he trademarked that term, world cash grab of hockey. Yeah. <laughs> had run out of ways to make revenues. They go, they go and turn thawed ice shavings into gold. Now, to be fair, nobody's holding a gun to anybody's head here. And for your $65, you're getting a lot more than just the residue from the Team USA Czech Republic game. You're actually getting a crystal replica World Cup of hockey puck and a, and a lovely box, both made in China, <laughs> from, 
from the people at Fan- Fanatics Mounted Memories, Inc. The crystal puck has the water sealed inside of it. Water picked up from the ice in an actual World Cup game, a process that is evidenced by an authentic numbered seal along with a picture of a bucket of ice <laughs> and, an- and another of the process of the pucks being filled. A certificate of authenticity is signed by Don Moffat, facilities operations supervisor for the NHL. He, he actually supervised uh, the ice sheet there in Toronto during the tournament. This unique collectible contains authentic playing surface from the World Cup of Hockey 2016. This is the certificate beams. The playing surface was acquired by Fanatics directly from the NHL. This crystal puck is officially licensed by the NHL. So when your trusty correspondent ventured into the main gift shop at Air Canada Centre for the World Cash Grab of Hockey, he was informed that the water-filled crystal pucks were actually moving at a pretty good rate. <laughs> and and why wouldn't they? As one Twitter follow pointed out, the water in those pucks might have the DNA of some of the greatest hockey players on the planet. In it. <laughs> so you spend your 65 bucks, break the crystal puck open, and pour it into your son's Wheaties in the morning, and presto, instant millionaire NHL hockey player. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a pretty wise investment. And then, of course, the article goes on. With a lot more tongue-in-cheek comments, but it was a pretty good article. And you can, again, you can click on the uh, link to it in the show notes. Yeah. So, all right. Well, now that we've ended that on a pretty light note, let's go ahead and uh, finish up. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? I, I don't, Wayne, other than I am really, uh, this is the last weekend before the season starts. And I, I'm, you know, I finally, my fix is, I'm getting my fix now every day because, I know the NHL is imminent, and so I feel much better as a person. I'm much <laughs> less, much less irritable, and uh, and I'm really looking forward to it. I'm, I, I enjoy working with you very, very much each week, and yep. uh, putting these shows together. You, I know you do an awful lot of work, and but it, it's a it's a great pleasure to be with you. I, I really enjoy working with you. And again, I'd like to remind too uh, everybody who's listening. We, we want you to uh, um, give us feedback and uh, tell us how we're doing, good or bad. We can take it. We got thick skin, um, yeah. but if you want to contribute to the show as well. Um, also, I, I didn't mention at the beginning of the show, um, we're looking for uh, the possibility of having some uh, um, guest hosts as well to help us out. If there's a team or league that you're passionate about that we're not currently talking enough about and you feel like you want to uh, contribute in such a way, go ahead and shoot us an email, drop us a voicemail, and um, we can uh, do some things behind the scenes and possibly get you uh, added to the show at least on a part-time basis anyway um, we're, we're looking to grow our audience we're looking to grow our community of hockey fans and uh, we definitely want to uh, we definitely want to hear from you if you're enjoying the show for sure so with that we'll go ahead and end it and uh, I will uh, talk to you next week Steve look forward to talking with you and working with you again Wayne all right <laughs> good night now you too well there you have it We'll see how good Steve and I are at picking the playoffs and awards in a few months. But for now, NHL hockey's back, and we couldn't be more excited about it. Next week, we'll be talking about all of the results in the last week of the preseason, and we'll we'll even have some coverage of some actual games that count. We can't wait. If you like the show, please show us your support by subscribing to it using your favorite podcatcher, program, or app. The Hockey Nuts podcast can be found on major podcast search engines like iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play Music. Just search for the term The Hockey Nuts in those apps. There are a few ways you can get involved with the show. You can email the show at feedback at thehockeynuts.com or you can leave us a voicemail in our voicemail box at 919-960-1718. We will address your feedback on future episodes of The Hockey Nuts Podcast. You can also tweet us. I'm at WayneHalley9. Steve is at sball504man. Also, be sure to visit our website at thehockeynuts.com. The site is as new as the show, but we have a blog going already, and you can listen to the show through your web browser on that website. In the future, we'll be offering all kinds of hockey-related resources on the website, not just for hockey fans, but for those of you who want to be involved in the game in your area as a player, coach, official, or even the Zamboni guy. As always, links and stories that we mentioned in the show are available in the show notes for this episode. You can now watch us record the show live each week on YouTube. We generally record on Wednesday nights, but sometimes we record on either Tuesday or Thursday if life prevents us to record on Wednesdays. Next week, we're planning on recording on Thursday, 
as I've got to go pick up my daughter at college for her fall break. Finally, we're looking for future guests for the show. Obviously, we're not experts on every team and league in hockey. So if you consider yourself more knowledgeable than us in a particular team or league, we definitely want to hear from you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Hockey Nuts Podcast. And until next week, we'll catch you at the rink. Oh, <laughs> my